Anyway, so thanks everybody for coming to this Real Friday seminar. I've not been at a Real Friday seminar for ages because I've got a six-year-old daughter <laughs> and she leaves school at three o'clock on a Friday and wants to go and do things, jump in the pool. Um, but it's great to be here today. So I want to introduce today is um, Cameron Baker. So Cameron Baker did his undergraduate at, um, at University of Queensland in ecology, then did an honours there with Craig Franklin and uh, then started his PhD and did his PhD there. I was actually his co-supervisor um, at University of Queensland and he did a lot of great stuff that he's going to tell you about today. And um, when he finished, I hired him to come and work with us. He's currently working with myself and Keller on uh, ARC Discovery, looking at the impact of crocodiles on Northern Territory rivers. Um, but he's going to talk today about his PhD project, which was a sort of integration of spatial ecology and social behaviour. So I'll take it away, Cameron. Oh, thank you for the introduction, Hamish. Just check the people online. Can you hear me as well? Just double check. Yes, that. we can. Yes, thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you all for coming along today to listen to my presentation. As Hamish mentioned, I'm going to be giving a sort of overcap of all the work I did during my PhD, looking into the social behaviours and systems of estuarine crocodiles. This is how it works. And of course, we'll use, oh, there we go. We'll just dim the lights a little bit. That's right. Is there anybody who wants to Well, that's really like okay, so before I begin my talk, I'd first like to start off by acknowledging not only the Larakia people whose land we are meeting on today, but I also want to acknowledge the Tepetigi, Tejumgunji, and Warungu peoples who are the traditional owners on the land on where my research was, was conducted. And I'd also like to recognize their continued and ongoing connection to country and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So over the last century, understanding the social behaviors and systems of animals has been a central focus in the study of animal behavior. And this is because understanding the social systems of animals is important, not only at the individual scale, where how individuals interact with one another can influence their behaviors and movements around the environment, their mate selection, access to resources and ultimate survival, but it can also influence things at the population scale, influencing genetic flow and dynamics within the population, as well as how information transferred between individuals. And as we've all unfortunately learned over the last couple of years, disease transmission. So it's not surprising when you go and look at the literature surrounding animal social behavior, you see there's a lot of work that has been done. However, you will quickly notice this work is not sort of unbiased. There's a very definite bias towards quite large, obvious animals that live in groups and are typically quite furry. And this has sort of resulted in the formation of an essential social dichotomy where animals are either viewed as being social, they live in groups, they socialize with one another all the time, or they're non-social, they live by themselves, they very rarely interact with one another. This, however, is a rather simplistic view of animal social behaviours, simply because all animals are inherently social. Regardless of how large of a group you live within, or if you live by yourself, you must still interact with other individuals of the same species in order to compete for resources, and to reproduce, and you have to have a minimum level of social competence to navigate these interactions in order to avoid the potential deleterious outcomes that can arise, such as inbreeding, injury from fighting, and disease transfer. So animal social behavior is probably much better viewed as a continuum ranging from social all the way through the non-social. With most animals, generally falling somewhere in the middle of these two extreme ends. The question then becomes, well, how do we determine where are species sitting along this sociality continuum and what are their social systems? 
So the traditional approach, which was first put forward by Robert Hine back in 1976, is you simply, you go out into the field, you find a group of animals, and then you watch them. You record how do individuals interact with one another. Then as you go through time, do it long enough, you can go on to step two, where you start to describe the relationships between individuals. And this is simply the patterning of those interactions through time. Once you have that sort of formatted out, then you can finally describe what is the overall social structure of your population, which is simply the nature of those relationships and their patterning through time. Now for group living animals, this is really easy. And I also like doing this requires simultaneously monitoring quite large cohorts of individuals all at once through time. So as I just mentioned, for social animals, really easy to do. You can go out, find a group, watch that group. For non-group living animals though, doing this is quite a challenge. And it's simply because observing and monitoring non-group living species is just hard to do. This is because they're often cryptic, highly mobile animals that are just difficult to observe. And it's also important to realize that how they may be interacting with one another may be occurring at greater spatial through the use of vocalizations or temporal through scent glands and scenting behaviors than what we typically describe as a social behavior. We're a quite direct interaction species where some others call across long distances and say, hey, I'm here, stay out of my spot. And so that really leads me into what was the central question of my PhD, which was simply how can we examine the social systems of non-group living species? To try and answer this, what I've gone through and done is I've gone and utilized techniques that are traditionally used in socioecology, such as going out, working out the association patterns of individuals, doing things like social network analyses and lag association rates. And I've also combined this with techniques from spatial ecology, so putting biotelemetry devices on to track individual movements, looking at individual movement patterns and home range analyses. And I've sort of been, throughout my PhD, trying to combine these two different fields to gain insights into the social behaviours and systems of non-group living species. To do this and develop this idea, I've gone through and used Star of Today's talk, the estuarine crocodile, as my model species. And I chose to use estuarine crocodiles as a model species for a couple of reasons. First, they're big. So once you get over the initial challenge of catching and restraining these animals, they're actually relatively easy to put telemetric devices to so we can track individual behaviors and movements. What's also interesting is they're right at an extreme end. They're considered to be the most agonistic and least social of all the extant crocodilians. And I'm sort of highlighting this here with some of these photos here showing various injuries we've seen of captured individuals within our study population through time. The only other considered to be the most agonistic and least social, they're also interesting because they have habitat restricted movements. It is very rare for crocodiles to move anywhere outside of the rivers, creeks, lagoons, billabongs that live in. And what this means is just by an individual moving throughout their environment, they may be forced into close encounters with other conspecifics. So here in this image, you can see this nice smaller crocodile just here down the bottom. But then when you look in the background of this image, you actually see a far larger animal in the background there. And so he's, that small animal is having to navigate that interaction with that much larger animal, which could potentially quite severely injure him. And I also just wanna point out, when I actually took this photo in the field, I didn't see that big crocodile, again, highlighting just how hard these animals are to observe in the field. And finally, crocodiles are also interesting to examine this idea with because they have three distinct movement tactics. So we think estuarine crocodiles, you would have this sort of nomadic male class, and this is a sort of mid-sized male between about three and a half to four and a half meters. And they're quite active throughout the river system. They have very low site fidelity, and they're essentially just constantly moving across massively large areas. At the opposite spectrum of this, you have resident males. And these are generally your larger animals, but also your smaller males who have this movement type where they just stay put within a one refined area. They can still move around at quite a large distances, 
but they're constraining that in, in a very distinct area of the river system. And then finally, we can't forget them, of course, we have female crocodiles. And female crocodiles typically show behaviors quite similar to resident males where they stay in one space quite often, except for when that female does what she just did there, she's gone and nested. So when that loops back around, we see her sitting at her normal home range in this really well-defined spot in the river system. And all of a sudden it gets to the nesting season, she shoots down the river, goes and lays her eggs and then guards that nest for the next two months. So for my PhD, the overall aim I had was to investigate the social behaviors and systems of estuarine crocodiles. More specifically, I wanted to first look at and examine whether crocodiles display evidence of spatial structuring. Then on down the next level, do crocodiles display evidence of social structuring? And then finally, at the individual level, does an individual's degree of activity or site fidelity influence how sociable they are? To do this, I was very fortunate enough to use a very long-term data set tracking the movements of crocodiles. So since 2008, the Franklin Eco Lab, which Hamish actually helped start this project going, in collaboration with Australia Zoo, have undertaken a long-term study tracking the behaviors and movements of crocodiles throughout the Wenlock River. To track these animals, the main telemetry I used throughout my PhD, I used acoustic telemetry. Where an acoustic transmitter at the size of your index finger is surgically implanted just behind the front left leg of a crocodile. Each one of these acoustic transmitters has their own unique acoustic barcode that is unique to that specific animal. And to detect those acoustic barcodes, we have a series of acoustic receivers indicated here on this map by all of these black dots spread throughout the Wenlock and Ducey rivers. Every single time a crocodile goes past one of those receivers, it records the exact date and time that occurred and who they were. So we can passively track their movements throughout the entire river system. And this number is actually a little bit old. So I was using about 200 animals for my study. I think we're up to about 240 animals fitted with these acoustic telemetry devices since 2008. So that leads me into the first level, the first question, main question of my PhD. Do crocodiles display evidence of spatial structuring. And this is really important to understand because how animals structure themselves in space and time is rarely random. So you see each of these eclipses here, these represent the home range of a different animal. And so if we look at the amount of spatial overlap present between individuals, and then how that spatial overlap shifts through time, we can actually gain important insights into the social behaviors of animals without having to go and directly look at them and find those interactions. And this is because spatial overlap is key for expressing social behaviors. You cannot interact with someone if you do not share space. So by first understanding how individuals share space and how consistent the space sharing is through time, we can get really good base level insights on what that sort of social system may be. And so what did I end up finding for this chapter? So on the x-axis here first, I have time lag in years from one to five years. And then on the y-axis, I have the, a lag spatial overlap rate. And what this lag spatial overlap rate presents and represents is what is the probability of two individuals that we still saw overlapping in space at time point zero, overlapping again with one another successively through time up to five years into the future. So how are they maintaining that spatial overlap? And in black, when the figures come up, that is what we observe the crocodiles doing. And in red, the red dotted line, that would be what we would expect the crocodiles to do if they were just moving and overlapping with one another, just at complete random chance throughout the river system. And what I ended up finding is firstly, crocodiles did display evidence of non-random spatial overlaps. You see that the black line is consistently above that random line. And what this demonstrates is that not only are individuals non-random associating, but they're actively maintaining these overlaps with one another throughout multiple years. So there's a nice high stability in those spatial overlaps. But also interestingly, an individual's movement tactic or influence the stability of these overlaps. 
So while resident males, super consistent through time, they don't really change, they keep those over for another. When you get to those nomadic males and even females, they sort of have these really sort of not random sort of associations with spatial with one another. They're not consistent through time. So the stability of these spatial alerts is influenced by an individual's movement strategy. So awesome. Tick one on level one, we see that there is non-random spatial structuring within estuarine crocodiles. Now I can move down to the second level, the second main question I had, which was do crocodiles display evidence of social structuring? And to do this, I took advantage of that massive acoustic data set I had access to. So here is a stretch of the river. That black dot represents an acoustic receiver. And then that orange area represents the potential detection range of that receiver. So anytime a tag crocodile goes inside that detection range, we detect that they are present at that receiver. And all I did is went through and figured out and got a sort of bunch of R code running to go and tell me, when did we see multiple crocodiles at the exact same receiver within four minutes of one another? And I then defined those co-occurrences at receivers as an association between individuals. During those associations, I don't know whether they're sitting right next to each other directly interacting, or they could be up to 800 meters apart, but because estuarine crocodiles can vocally communicate with one another up to a kilometer away, Within that 800 meters sort of radius, I can at least assume they're probably at least aware of each other's presence. So they're associating, not interacting. And doing this, I was actually able to identify 43,589 associations between 159 individual crocodiles from 2010 to 2020. Although the talking thing's hiding that number on everyone. And what I did is I could find those associations, I then applied and created all of these social networks of the population. So within a social network, each of these white points represents an individual crocodile. And then those gray lines between those points indicate whether those individuals are associating with one another with thicker lines indicating a stronger association between that pair of individuals. And so doing that, I went through and calculated those social networks for every single month of the 10 years I was tracking crocodiles. What was really cool is then when you plot these sort of social networks out. So not only do I find these sort of non-random social structures. So we see individuals interacting with one another, but they also had long-term preferences and long-term aversions with who they interacted with and associated with. But these networks, as you can also see in the social network, actually form these really unique little communities down there community systems. So each of these different colors represents a different crocodile social community. Those individuals within that community associate with one another more than they do with anyone outside of their community. What was really cool is when we plotted these communities down the river system, you actually see this really nice spatial sort of segregation down the system. So each sort of block down the river, you're having a different community of crocodiles living there. And so, cool, crocodiles are actually living within a highly sort of structured social system that is split into these different distinct communities. But then I was also interested not only just showing these communities, what's happening with them through time? How stable is this within a year? So on the plot here, I have month along the x-axis and on the y-axis, I have the proportion of time an individual was seen associating with another conspecific, another crocodile. And when I plot this data up, circles will indicate pairs of immature animals. Triangles will represent a mature and an immature crocodile interacting. And squares will indicate a mature and a mature crocodile interacting with one another. And what we actually see when we look at this through time is it's not constant throughout the year. While immature animals, they are consistent. They sort of have a very stable rate of association with one another through time. Mature animals show this really distinct dynamic um, cyclic behavior throughout the year. With this red dotted line here indicating the mating season. So what we're actually seeing in the crocodile social system and structure is that during the start of the year, so right now, there's very little structure present in the population. They're not very interacting with, with each other much. 
And that's because they'll be out on the floodplains feeding and moving around. Then as we start to go into the dry season, we have them coming back into the river systems. And that's when we start to see interactions and associations forming. And that starts to build up. It builds up prior to the onset of the mating season, again, in that red dash box, stays up high during the start of the mating season. And then it starts to decay out before the rain start to hit. So it's actually potentially driving this shift in the social system is actually the adult females leaving from the system to go and nest. And then that system starts to decay down into the wet season. So crocodiles also have this really highly dynamic social system that's influenced by both time of year and an individual's maturity status. So also tick number two, crocodiles do have evidence of social structure. Then I finally went into the third and final question of my PhD, which was, does an individual's degree of activity or site fidelity influence their sociability? Before I can answer this specific question though, I have to first answer the question, do crocodiles display evidence of personality? And by personality, what I am referring to is do crocodiles display distinct repeatable differences between individuals in their expression of a, of a behavior? So you see evidence of an animal having personality. If you look at a behavioral measure, which will range from low to high, and then you look at the, an individual expression and you see personality when each individual has a distinct, different behavioral expression in that, that occupying their own little behavioral niche. So do crocodiles see that? So on the x-axis here, I have crocodile ID. And then on the far plot, I have sociability. And I calculated sociability simply as what is the number of individuals, other crocodiles and individuals associated with within a month divided by the number of individuals they could have potentially associated with. Then in the middle, I have crocodile activity, and this is simply how far are crocodiles traveling per day within a month. And finally, I have site fidelity, which is, which is just the measure of how much spatial overlap is there with a the crocodile with the home range between one month and the next. And what I found is that for all three behaviors, for both males in blue and females in orange, Crocodiles do all differ in their behavioral expressions. They have personality in each of these three behaviors. So this is great. I can actually move on to answer the question I'm interested in, which was does an individual's degree of activity or site fidelity influence how social they are within the system? So in these plots here, along the x-axis, we, so we have activity on the far one, Site fidelity here, and then on the y-axis, we have an individual's degree of sociability. So in the first plot, when we look at whether activity influences sociability, we actually find that yes, it does, there is a negative correlation present here. So crocodiles who are on average display a more active behavioral niche and phenotype, they're actually less sociable individuals. Then when we looked at look the question of, do we see this does the same trend happen with site fidelity? Do we see a positive correlation? Well, what I actually found is there's no correlation at all. An individual's degree of site fidelity does not influence whether they're sociable or not. Again, there is a slight, potential slight positive trend, but when you look at the statistics of it, there's no sort of effect that we can actually say is going on. And so what this actually suggests is that individuals may potentially be modulating how they associate with conspecifics depending on their degree of activity. And so cool, final tick, yes, activity is, it does influence how sociable crocodiles are. And so bringing that all together, what do I find? What does it all mean? Well, the first simple result is that rather than this being these big asocial animals that are completely intolerant of one another, estuarine crocodiles actually live within a higher dynamic and structured social system that is influenced by an individual's maturity status, their movement strategy, and the proximity to the crocodile mating season. And what I also demonstrate is and highlight is how by integrating techniques from spatial and social ecology, we can actually use these together to gain insights into the social behaviors and systems of non-group living species. 
Of course, being a PhD, this is not an overall fully comprehensive research topic of the subject. So there are multiple future directions this project and this sort of line of research would go into. But the first simply being those communities, if we go back and look at them, are they forming around that big, a big central boss crocodile? Or are they actually being influenced by resource availability within the system? Do crocodiles display kin preferences? So I did find long-term preferences between individuals, but are they preferentially associating with individuals that they're related to or not? How does density influence the social system of crocodiles? If they're forced into a more high density environment, does that shift how they behave? Does it shift their personalities at all? And more broader outside of crocodiles, simply what are the social systems of other non-group living species? I've shown how we can utilize these two, two different techniques from spatial and social ecology together to gain insights into this. So that'll be really interesting to go and look at various other different species and see what is they sort of displaying? What patterns do they have? And then finally, a real interesting side pocket that by combining these two different techniques can actually start to gain insights into is how does context-specific avoidance influence the behavior and distribution of individuals? To date, we have very little understanding of how avoidance influences social behavior because it's very hard to identify. By looking at and integrating spatial ecology with those social behaviors, we can start to unravel best potentially unknown aspects of animal behavior so far. So finally, thank you all for listening. I want to thank, acknowledge the traditional owners again, thank my supervisors and collaborators. And yeah, happy to take any questions anyone might have. Uh, thanks, Jim. Uh, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thanks for that, Cameron. It's very informative. Uh, with the acoustic transmitters, you uh, you described how they uh, so you how you identify when an animal comes into a zone. Presumably, you also identify when that animal leaves the zone. Yeah. So you've got time that the animals are together or in proximity. So that seems like a whole nother level of data there that, did you did you look at that sort of time together? As so there is some stuff in the pieces that I didn't put in here, but I did look at the time. So on average, crocodiles were associated with one another for about 16 minutes, but there was massive variation in that. That was varying from three seconds together all the way up to 16 hours. But there is a big sort of spread in there, but on average, about 16 minutes so far. Yes. Oh. Hi. Uh, thanks for that. The the um that graph, the ultimate graph, the activity versus sociability. Um activity is obviously a fairly simplistic. Um, term and and way to look at that, but you've got those three groups you were looking at, and I wonder to what extent it's driven by those groups versus being activity itself. So did you break down the correlation into resident males, nomadic males, and females to see how activity versus sociability related within those groups? So that's a really good question. And it's actually gone the opposite way. So we started with those categorical definitions of resident, nomadic, female, because that is what we had at the time. And that included activity, site fidelity, and all these behaviors together. For that chapter, by going through and looking at that personality spectrum, I was actually able to transform that categorical variable into a continuous variable. So individuals are a continuous spectrum range in their activity. And separate from that, they also correlate and differ in their site fidelity. And I didn't show the plot in this one because it was a bit of a redundant plot, but there is a very tight correlation between an individual's activity personality and their site fidelity. It's just a, a negative correlation. The more active you are, the less site fidelity you have. And so those two factors are inherently correlating together in a behavioral syndrome, but then separately to that, I wanted to look at those two 
components of that sort of movement strategy separately. So which one of those two was driving that? Because yeah, as you say, I could have initially looked at, does a resident male have higher sociability than a nomadic male? But then it doesn't really get to the base question of which of the behaviors that make up those categories are actually driving that sociability. Mm -hmm. That's why I went with the approach of separating them out to look at distinct behavioral syndromes. Because it gets hard when you try to look at more than two behavioral syndromes at once. It's, like, yeah, it's, it's a complex field. And look at the timing. I should have also put another whole aspect of that third chapter in, which is looking at the consistency of those behaviors. Because the individuals not only differ in the personality they have, but how consistently they display that behavior. And yeah, that's a whole other aspect. Uh, Sam first. I bet you can't. <laughs> um, I used to work on possums ages ago doing some social interaction stuff and I've got a question about crocodiles but just <laughs> intro. Um, and one thing we found was they were really sociable with each other under conditions of really high resource availability when you started getting a bit of resource competition they turn into selfish jerks except they would hang out just with their own relatives there was this strong kin preference whereas when there were, everything was good didn't matter you could so i was wondering about it'd be interesting in crocs if you know you get those places like kale's crossing shady camp where clearly there's food everywhere and high densities of crocodiles and you got you know the kin aspects of sociality and overall as you know to what extent is that just mediated by resource availability you know do they relax and everyone's friendly when times are good sort of thing so that's that comes into one of the capacities of looking at social behaviors it really is context dependent at the time you're looking at it so for the one like project fortune we can't quantify resource value that is something i'd really love to try and look into in the future in that system but yes, you will see that at, as resource value shifts, so as it increases, in general, animals become more tolerant of one another. So there's less competition for those scarce resources. And as it increases, they become less tolerant. And yeah, it'd be really interesting. You would sort of see that there with the crocodiles. So again, that's where putting animals onto that sociality continuum becomes complex because different aspects, different times of the year may shift where they sit at some points. Are really sociable, and then other times of the year, they'll be really unsociable. One, one team track behind another. There is a side project I'm sort of working on outside of my PhD, building on that third chapter, looking, bringing con specific density into the effect on those personalities. And there is a density effect for all three of those behaviors. But I've got to finish and analyzing that data and writing it up sort of around everything else I'm doing now. So eventually we'll sort of look at it, but there is a really cool density effect where at higher con specific density, you see crocodiles become a lot more sociable with one another. They decrease activity and increase site fidelity. But it's still a lot of, still pending, still coming work. Um, thanks, Cameron. Um, my question as well relates to the, the social groups that you found there. It's really interesting. And I was, you alluded to it, I think, on the last slide about <clears throat> future directions, but I was just wondering, did you have any hypotheses about the traits of the individual crocodiles that, that are forming those clusters on what might explain why they, they're together? In those clusters because it would seem to me you have a lot of good data to to test some hypotheses of, you know is it you might have even if you had size or estimated age um even the personality um trait measures or or and kin, kinship if you have um if you could get genetics you know <clears throat> do you have hypotheses on what you think might explain why individuals are together yeah so it's and there are a lot of thoughts on it. So I think the whole idea of that big boss crocodile idea, I don't think is as solid as it once was. We have some work that's, that was done by an honest gym master found really high core range overlap between big males. So I don't think it's just centered around a single big male. I think, but it's based off that resource and value at that point. There's a really good point there. Mm -hmm. You can actually have a, a couple of crocodiles 
who all sort of want to access the more resources and actually cluster it together mm. in the environment. Through time, those individuals increase their familiarity with one another. And as individual familiarity increases, you become less agonistic towards them. You sort of build your sort of dominant structure and you know mm. where you sit in that. So that's all aspects of it. And then sort of highlight here, but you do see that while those communities sort of collapse during the wet season, mm. they are coming back with a similar comp a group of individuals. Because no one's ever looked at the social behavior of these animals in real depth before, I sort of really just focus on the top level, just describe the board structure. But I really, yeah, would love to go down that deeper level of within those communities, who's the size, who's the most central in that community, how does this individual size impact that? Mm. You probably will see there is a joint tower as we go up the set size scale, and then a sex, and we change all of that. Mm. Yeah, as you say, it's definitely the, all the data is there to do it. It's now just getting honor students and PhD students to start building off this starting point mm. to really go into the depth of that. Yeah, a lot to be done. Thank you. As a wetland ecologist, I'm petrified of crocodiles. <laughs> I'm just petrified. But that made me think that they are predators. And I was just wondering whether you started with prior knowledge about how you would expect a predatory species to interact compared to, say, a herbivorous species. I also went to this without any sort of general preconception because even within predatory species, you see a wide range of social structures. It goes from the tight knit family groups of lions all the way to solitary leopards, polar bears, and that. And so it's really hard to just generalize that herbivores are going to have this social structure because they're herbivore predators. This structure. Yeah, but if you herb. if you're at risk of being eaten by a, a member of your same species, presumably that would influence some of your social behaviour. It will probably just really ramp up that avoidance. I was sort of indicating towards at the end. Currently, we have a really good understanding of how individuals interact with one another and preference, but avoidance is just the opposite side of that coin, and that is probably a key factor influencing the structure of big predatory species like crocodiles, like leopards, polar bears and that, because smaller individuals do have that fear. If you come across that big animal, if you don't know who they are, they could just turn around and kill you. So avoidance is actually a really key aspect. And today, we just don't know. There's only been a handful of studies that we looked at the idea of avoidance because of how hard it is to show. It's really difficult to show absence of interaction than showing presence of interaction. And that's where integrating spatial ecology, bringing space use and spatially explicit null models, we can actually start to better tease that apart and say that if you don't see interaction, that's different than what you'd expect if they're just moving randomly in the environment by chance, that is your avoidance. And from there, you can start teasing apart that role of avoidance in the formation of animal structures and systems. Yeah, we just... It's an aspect that we don't know. It's an aspect I'd really love to look into a lot more in the future, but it's just finding the time, getting it all sort of sorted. It's not an easy thing to do. Oh, well, well I've got the microphone. <laughs> um, it seems that the Wenlock River is in the wet, dry tropics side of the Cape. So how do you think things might change if you're on the wet, wet side where you had more, you had that less seasonal signal? Yeah, so that's... A really good question. It's, it's hard to say. It could be similar, see that similar sort of trend. A key thing is though, that seasonal okay, this show it wasn't related to the wet coming. It was that decay side exactly at the end of October, start of November, right when the female crocodiles start to leave the nesting sites. So it seems to be in crocodiles, it is more of a shift around the mating season so as that participates out. Because if you've got a group of males sort of presenting, trying to like get themselves a mate, once those females start leaving, you sort of, you lose your goal of being in that group. So you'll start to move off. So along that idea, you might not see any difference in that system. But in, into the, into that before wet tropics, we just don't know yet. If you just purchase something need to do it, but it's just difficult getting crocodile telemetry studies going because of the public fear of if you catch a crocodile and release it, 
and that then has an interaction, a negative interaction with people. What's the sort of ethical dilemma around that? But I'd love to see way more projects of different areas. I think the river system that I've got here was probably different to a real billabong centered social system, but just don't know how it's going to go yet. It's a lot of, it's a good starting point with like, we can have this another space to build on, build on hypotheses, but it's now just figuring it out still. Side of things, behavior. I don't think I've been.